Well, we are so excited to have you on an episode of the Ginchiest Kavita. Welcome. If you could explain um, what specifically you're doing your PhD and where, that would be wonderful. So again, thanks, Yola and Dan, for this opportunity to speak on your channel. It's an honor, I feel, and thankful to both of you, so thank you. So I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC, and my advisor is Dr. Tim Oates. And the focus of my dissertation is on assistive robotics and trying to build accessible interfaces to control these assistive robots. These robots are actually going to help with daily living. They're going to be tailored toward a broad variety of users with all types of abilities. This is so exciting because Dan and I, we did an episode on um, robotics and wanting the robotic revolution to begin already in the area of personal care. Did that why I shall have that you can um, uh, uh, what has up uh, been um, personal care robot? And you got your undergrad. Well, there's still a long way to go. As of now, there are a lot of prototypes out there, and they still have not reached the market, but still there's a lot of projects in development. And robots like what Panasonic has made. Uh, there's a bed, actually, a robotic bed that actually converts itself to a wheelchair. So that's some progress when, when we think about transferring because then that eliminates the need for the transfers. But again, uh, that's in Japan, and I don't believe it's out in the market yet. They also have another robot called Weba, and it looks like a giant teddy bear, right? And it scoops under the person and lifts the person straight off the bed. So many of these robots that are out there right now are in like hospitals or rehab facilities, but they have not reached home. And I think that's a huge barrier to people getting accessibility. What other companies do you know of are working on specifically a personal care ro robot? Samsung is coming out with the mobile robot with the uh, arm on it that can do your dishes. So that's going to be helpful to a lot of people, not just people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it can pick up objects on the floor. What do you feel are the challenges in developing a personal care robot? Safety is one of the biggest hurdles. Uh, we want to make sure when the robot is working with people directly interacting with them and it's safe for the person using it. And that's the greatest challenge because the robot does not know when there's pain. So we have to help the robot infer, provide knowledge so that it knows when to detect pain. And if it detects pain, what's the next step it should do? We've seen on your YouTube channel some of the the designs that you're thinking of um, in, in doing some of those transfers and then moving in the bed. But what about the fine motor skills of getting someone dressed, you know, buttoning uh, buttons on a shirt yeah, that's it. Or, or hooks, you know, right. to clothing? Right. Fine motor is definitely something even better for robots and even humans. 
because there's actually uh, robotic surgeries that are being performed actually, where the surgeon is in, like, in New York and the patient is in London and they can do the surgery remotely to the robot. So fine motor uh, is actually really good for robots. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, it's, it feels so tantalizingly close, but yet so far, because I mean, as far as it sounds like we, there really isn't one today right. that, that people are using to, to be able to be fully self-sufficient with their daily care. Cost is one of the major hurdles, too, because people can't afford it to. But, but here's the thing. I mean, okay, people can't afford it, but essentially this has the potential to completely revolutionize industries that are antiquated. Do you foresee there being pushback from the home healthcare industry as well as the assisted living industries? Because if robots were developed that were sufficient and even better than human beings, and providing assistance with personal care, we wouldn't need these industries anymore. Many healthcare workers have the fear of losing their jobs because of the development of these robots, because they are afraid that they may replace these people helping us. Okay, so there is the fear, but again, I believe that they will not lose their job, but they're responsibilities may change. For example, they may find a way to monitor, control, and supervise these robots. So they may have new responsibilities and they should not have any fear at all. What do you think about that model? What do you think about other people managing your personal care robot? I mean, right now we have pretty much healthcare workers that are come to our lives as strangers, right? And they help us. So when we have these new technologies, I believe it in some ways it would create more independence for us. Like for example, during this pandemic, one of the challenges I faced was uh, two of my healthcare providers got COVID and I was stuck without help. I really hope these technologies can sooner, and that's why I'm trying really hard to push on these answers. Do you then, Kavita, feel that we will see a personal care robot in our lifetimes that will replace, you know, all human help that we get right now? I don't believe all of We still have to rely on some help because of the safety factor. But gradually, I think as things improve technology improves that it would be better. Like just take for example the internet, right? In the 1980s, no one even knew what the internet was. And now everybody's using it worldwide. So as technology improves and more and more people are you know getting knowledge about this, I think we'll see more advancement and more people will accept it and use it. It's interesting you say that because I kind of have, I, I selfishly like think about a hundred years from now, what that generation is going to say <laughs> about people like us living with disabilities a hundred years ago. They, they're going to say, I can't believe people live like that. Because I think about that even of, of, of people with disabilities back in the 1950s, I see images of foster children and the way that in which they were treated and what their lives looked like and even their lifespans right. uh, were, were dramatically different. And even when we think about our condition, my condition, I have spinal muscular atrophy. There was never a cure or treatment before, but now as medical sciences have improved, we have like three different three treatment options. Uh, yeah. And that's incredible. I never thought that would come in my life. Yeah, me neither. And it makes me extremely grateful. But at the same time, there are so many other neurological or neuromuscular conditions that 
still have zero treatment right. and treatment options for them. We, we are in the group that is extremely fortunate uh, for, for having some, some options. What do you think is thing take knowledge say about what you so whatever you need, we find ways to provide that as solutions to technology. I mean, the people developing the technology, they are doing it for their own need, right? So people with disabilities, I believe, should be more involved and prioritize in putting their opinion to people are developing these technologies. The designing of these technologies should include people with disabilities as consumers early on in their product design instead of at the later stage. Mm -hmm. So I think that should be a priority, but unfortunately still, still many people do not do that. I had never heard of anyone else that was doing work that you're doing. Uh, with a disability like I, I, we have one friend who he had developed a um, communicator board himself yeah. his name is Carl Sigmund he's awesome aside from him I don't know of anyone else like why do you think people with disabilities are not as involved in developing the technologies that they need very challenging for all of us first of all to voice our opinions. And I think the, we have to first accept and take pride in our disability first as a community. And mm -hmm. once we get through that phase, the next stage is how do we make sure we feel more inclusive in society? And in order to feel that way, we need opportunities and we need accessibility. And we have to make sure that we raise our voice to make sure that happens. We need to be around people that support us. Even when people disperse us, we should not take that to heart and just find new people to be around to support our kids. No, it's very, very important. You're right about support and feeling as though we um have that from our environment and the people around us. Around what time frame are you working towards to get your PhD? Within the next six months, I should be finished. Really? Yeah. I hope That's so. huge. Yeah, I do. That's awesome. Well, we are rooting for you, Kavita. Mm -hmm. We are so excited that you made the time and joined us today, really. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful time spending with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching another episode of The Genshies where we talk about our disability experiences and what they teach us about being human. Oh my god, you ruined it. <laughs>